a seat. Excellent. All right, we're going to dive right in. Uh, this, I know the title out there is a little weird. I don't know what happened in the translation, but this is uh, Visual Development and Production Design. And the, this extra title will be on the pretty pictures because we're going to try and talk about how, what we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I didn't learn this until I was well into the industry, and I wish I'd learned it when I was in school. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to warn you, it's a little esoteric, a little out there, a little crazy. Bear with me, and if you have questions, we do have question time at the end. I'll do my best to fill you in. Thank you for being here. We're going to dive right in. Oh, that's not right.
And that's what we're going to be talking about today. What is authentic design? How do we get to it? How do we make something transcend its time? How do we make something that feels real that we believe in? I personally believe that the, the reason that Star Wars is the hit it is today, there's, I think there's two reasons. One is that the, there wasn't all these people who are Hollywood who being calcified into a system. And there wasn't a director who directed them. So everyone was hungry and young and trying to figure out this new medium. So I think that was a big part of it. But I think another, the biggest part for me is just authentic design. And there's a lot of things to call it. You can call it uh, authentic design or functional design. We'll talk about a lot of those terms in the talk today. So let's talk a little bit more about that. This authentic design comes from the designers on the film. Uh, Ralph McFerry, who's a production designer, was a master of functional design. He came from Boeing. Before he was working on Star Wars, he was doing big paintings of real planes, and real structures, and real buildings, and real machinery. So he brought all this knowledge of things that actually work. Scale, how do you put something together, rivets. Um, and Joe Johnston, who uh, was the big designer on the movie, he designed most of the spaceships, uh, adjusted them, did a lot of stuff. He came from industrial design. So he was not, again, a film fancy film designer. He came out of industrial design and brought all this authenticity to the process. He was also really into model making and kit dashing. So this was what uh, the spaceships on Star Wars looked like. It was a common, Campbell was the designer of the spaceships. And this is what they looked like before that team came on. And there's a bunch of things you're going to see here. Like, there's, there's not, how, how big is that ship? How does it work? How is it put together? None of that stuff was in the design. And this is what Joe Thompson brought to the table. Right? That's really powerful. That is the, the nuts and bolts. You believe this world. And because you believe this world, even though it's sci-fi, it transcends its era. It transcends things that are popular with it. So this didn't happen by accident. Uh, Joe Johnston, this is a story. So authentic design, in my opinion, is story-based design. Uh, this is a quote from him. There's a great documentary on Disney Plus right now called Light Magic, about the early days of industrial light magic. And the quote comes from it. It's a great documentary. Anyway, Joe Johnson says, George always saw the rebel fleet as essentially hot rods. The guys that acquired this stuff used and it was beat up, and they piece it together to supercharge the engines. Already, there's tons of storytelling in that, right? It's, we know who the people are, what kind of people they are, what they're doing with these machines, that they're beat up, they're old. All that storytelling. All that work that Campbell was doing, these models, he didn't have any of that story yet. That's part of authentic design. Another part of authentic design, base design, is this actual story idea that, that uh, Ralph, Joe Johnson is uh, talking about, uh, Ralph Ferry here. He said, it was Ralph who said, if the rebels are having to build this stuff themselves, they are building it from scratch. They would use flat panels, they would use cut up stuff or what it, steel or whatever materials rebels had and they would build these out of panels. So already we're seeing functional design. The design is coming from a place of who are these people, what materials do they have, how are you how are they doing this? How are they building out of this? And already there's storytelling about the character of, of the rebels. That's what we're doing in functional design. We're not just trying to make it look cool or uh, like following the trends of today. We're trying to get deeper into the storytelling of the moment. So we'll talk about more how to do that. So that's Star Wars. Star Wars is story-based design. They take creative risks to follow that story. Uh, they're based on characters and emotion, like we're talking about, like the Rebels versus uh, not. And it's functional focus. So it's function over form. We'll talk more about all this kind of stuff. On the other end is Logan's run. So this is a quote from the director, Michael Anderson. I'm totally fascinated by science fiction. And whenever I'm asked to do it, I jump at it because it's something I really enjoy. You can use your imagination more. It opens up visual aspects that are taboo, and you don't get the opportunity to do it in the whole films. So it's all about aesthetics. It's all about things I get to do instead of storytelling. They should be the same. There's no difference between a science fiction film and a whole film, right? They're exactly the same. They're storytelling, and so we don't treat them differently. That's why it doesn't feel grounded. So here's some of the reference. In my opinion, Logan's Run, and I've watched it a bunch of times, is aesthetic-based design. So it's just about how it looks. It's Creative precedent, so they went around and said, "What's cool right now?" and they followed that as a design ethos. They're just copying what's cool. This is actually a mall in Texas that they just souped up. Uh, it's moment-based design, saying, "Oh, what would be cool to do here?" as opposed to how does that fit the whole film? And it's form first and function second. So we'll talk more about all the stuff as we go through. So I didn't come to this uh, easily, and you may have heard this story. I'm going to tell it again because it's um, the way that I learned the difference between 
uh, aesthetic-based design that, that they designed. And it came to me when I started at Pixar. I did start my career out of Pixar, or at ILM. That's, I painted those hills in the background of uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. I painted some panels there in the Hulk, and this is Terminator 3. And I left and worked at DreamWorks. And all of this time, I was chasing just trying to make some shots of cool shots of cameras. Like, how do I make these shots awesome and amazing? And it worked a little bit. But it wasn't until I got to Pixar, and I had a long time to learn this. My first lessons were on Wally. I worked on Up, Brave, Big Dinosaur, Cars 3, Inside Out, uh, Aquabird, and then now our new series is uh, Win or Lose, which is out next year. That we're designing. But all through this journey, it's been reinforcing these ideas about authentic design and how do we capture that. So the story is, I was a couple months into working at Pixar, and I was working on the landing site for this acronym. And this is where we were in design. We looked at a ton of stuff. We did good research. We looked at landing sites, NASA launch sites, and airports, and terminals, and all this kind of stuff around the world. Um, but one thing that Ralph Eggleston, our production designer, felt is that, that this shape was not iconic enough, that it had to read from across the bay. Um, because there's story points where Wally comes up to his truck, and he looks across the bay and sees this little tower over there. That tower had to be iconic so we could connect it to a bunch of different moments. And I was like, I, okay, I guess I'll go back to my office. And I was doing a lot of stuff like with pen and ink at the time, these little, so I did like 40 of these, 50 of these in a week. And pasted them all up, got them all laid out, and had them on two boards, and I thought, oh man, they're gonna love this. They're such cool little marker drawings. Look at these just cool shapes that I'm doing. Uh, and I got in the art review room, and Andrew Stanton, who's the director of Wall, he was going around, and he was not having a good day. And as he went around, he started getting more angry and frustrated at people. I was like, oh, man, but when he gets to my work, it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> and then he wasn't. He got to my work, and he was just quiet. And he fills up with redness when he gets angry. And he started, to, like, you see it come out of his collar. And I was like, oh, no. And he did start yelling. In those days, there was lots of yelling and screaming and, and filmmaking. Hopefully, most of that's out these days. Um, I don't believe in it because I don't think you should treat people that way, but also because I don't, I blank. I was like a deer in the headlights. I don't remember anything. <laughs> the only thing I remember in that whole exchange, I don't remember if this is the beginning or the end, is that he said, you're not just an artist, damn it, you're a storyteller. That's the only thing I remember from the whole thing. But I was like, oh man, I don't need this. I'm going to go back to DreamWorks. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> then a bunch of friends and Ralph came over and said, no, no, you got to stay. It's all fine. It'll all work out. And it has worked out. But that was the beginning. That little kernel, you're not just an artist, you're a storyteller. So I had been focusing on my craft, right? So we all have been spending a ton of time of our career looking at other artists and saying, we want to make work like that. Super important. We all have to do that. We have to develop as artists. But, and we go to art school, or we learn from schools online, or come to places like this, and it's all about craft. How do we get better at drawing? And it's super important. How do we get better at painting? But at a certain point, you need to make a shift. The craft has to be a service of something. And I didn't realize that. So I was just doing cool shapes. But I had to realize those shapes have to be a service of storytelling. And why Andrew was angry with me is because I made him do my job. Right? So I didn't make any choices about authentic design or function or all these things we've been talking about that Star Wars did. I instead just made a bunch of cool shapes and put them up on boards for you decide. And for him, how is that he has to in the meeting in front of a bunch of people come up with a great reason for that shape that I just blacked and made? And he was angry because of it. I don't blame him. But that was the beginning of it. So that was the beginning of my journey. So we're going to start talking about how you can figure this out. What is your journey to do this? So you don't run into your first art review and, and face the wrath of your director. So the first step is beginning to recognize authenticity in visual development, in design in general. What is authentic? And this is a side for you. We'll get to you as a person and your authenticity. Right now, we're just looking, how do you recognize it outside of you? That's the first step. So for me, there's two pieces to this. The first is we want to always design with purpose. There's a lot of design that is mindless. Right? So I'll just throw some shapes out and hope that something cool comes along. That's fun, and it's a great technique, and it's good to relax your mind. But that's not for great design, right? Because you're hoping accidentally you'll stumble across something good. Instead, we want to flip that. We want, every time we do design, we want to do it Focus it towards something. What are we trying to solve? What are the story things we're trying to tell? We'll get more into all of that. And the second is uh, function over form. We want to get function first, and then the form meets that function. 
So what does that mean? Design with purpose is design as I practice it in the form of communication. My goal is to communicate to Andrew Stanton that this shape is the best shape and why it's the best shape. So in review, if I'm pitching, everything is about communication. This stuff is not meant to be hanging on a wall. That's the first part of it. The second part is design as I practice it is always in the service of the story. If you're not doing design to service the story, you're drawing, which is great. We should all draw all the time, but that's not design. Design is to be in the service of something. All right, and the third piece is design as I practice it is equal parts aesthetic choices and problem solving. So we'll break each one of those down a little bit because there's a bunch of word salad there. So this is a great the example. This is by uh, Pete Doctor. Uh, great example is design is a form of communication. This is not rendered out. There's not, it's not fancy. There's no lighting in here. There's no fur. There's no great technique. There's none of that stuff because it doesn't need it. It's trying to communicate something about these two characters. Right? This, is not, this is done on a little piece of paper before art review. All of what we're doing, the beauty comes as a secondary thing. We're trying to communicate ideas. We have to inspire the team. We have to make them want to be working on the film. Those are secondary. The first is communication. So this is not meant to be on the wall. Ironically, of course, you can buy it at Disney. $359.99. But that's not the goal of it, right? So this is the second. Design is in service of the story. I always love this ring because everyone tells me, like, I want to do sci fi. I'm like, great. Look at this. This is from Blade Runner. There's no Blade Runner. What in here is sci fi? Nothing. Nothing, because it's story-based. Well, everything in here is telling you about the character, telling you about opulence and power and control and metal eagle above him. Maybe there's some little things that are like EKG over there in the corner, maybe sci-fi. Sci-fi is not about just making things sci-fi. Sci-fi is still storytelling. Why, why are we making a difference between uh, normal films and fantasy, or normal films and sci-fi? They're the same thing. We have to tell story both of them. And Ridley Scott did amazing work in the early Aliens, and Blade Runner, and all these movies that are so story driven. I absolutely love this frame. Here's another really Scott movie. Design is both equal parts aesthetics and problem solving. So in here, this is the first one of the first movies that there's privacy in it. So there has to be a lot of labor. Now in privacy, people are hanging upside down and all kinds of crazy stuff because we already have a language for privacy. But before there's a language for privacy, you have to communicate that idea. So everyone's laying down, like we sleep. Problem solved, right? Oh, people are sleeping. Uh, EKT is hooked up to them. Oh, they need to take their vitals. Wearing diaper type things. Oh, they must be doing this for a long time. Oh, the, and then the chambers are covered. Oh, there must be some kind of magic gas or something that, that allows them to do this. All of that is problem solving and storytelling. None of that is fancy aesthetics. The fancy aesthetics are then the shape and the room that you put around, which is important. That's super important, but the storytelling is the thing that's driving this shot. And it makes it meaningful, and it makes it memorable. And so now privacy is a thing in sci-fi, but it wasn't until an artist solved that problem visually. We're visual sol problem solvers, okay? So that's that first step. We're to have design with purpose. Every time we're designing, we're trying to think of these things. The next step is we're going to try and figure out form over function. This is a tricky one, because sometimes it feels like, I don't know if this is form or function. So we're going to do a little test and talk about that. All right, so this, we're going to look at some slides. This is the first outdoor image from Star Wars, the, the, the series. Uh, and if you look at this, is there anyone who thinks, I guess we'll just ask the question, is this form over function or function over form? For me, it's function first. And the reason is, is almost everything in here is something we've seen in our life. Right? Almost everything. There's two sun, two suns is the only thing we've never seen before. Everything else is something we've seen, and it's kind of standard. Right? This desert is an actual desert. This is a, uh, ga a natural gas rig. Uh, that's an igloo, but they just did it in something else. So again, language that we already understand. They're not blowing story language. And then these are some boxes, which we've seen before. So everything in that air is functional. We understand what it's for and what it's doing. Right? So for my mind, this is function first. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. The next shot I'm going to show you is the first shot from the prequels. And see if you feel the same about it. Right? Yeah. Form first, right? On the far end over there, there's a building you can't get to if you don't have a space pack. 
or some jet or some airplane. If that's form first, it's not a functional driven. So what ends up happening is our uh, brain starts to go away, questions like why, why am I seeing this? What is it for? Why am I seeing mostly waterfall? And why is the building over? What is going on over here? How's the town laid out? We start asking questions. And we don't want to ask questions. We want to answer questions. Our good job is problem do and problem solve. And so this becomes a form first issue. Okay? All right. Why is this important? This is this is the next series of slides is the most some of the most important for me. Why is this important? Why don't why do I care? Why can't I just make stuff that looks cool? You can make stuff that looks cool. I'm not saying don't make stuff that looks cool. But aesthetic based design is a journey. Right? It's a journey. You don't have an answer in the beginning. You're gonna figure it out as you go along. Right? Um, so as you go along, if you design intent, the goals and intentions of your design are storytelling, emotion, characters, and that's all expanding your scope. Right? None of those things are locking you in. However, if we think about aesthetic-based design, it's a destination. I want to make something cool. We already know where we want to go. It's, we're not open to possibilities along the way. All we care about is coolness. It is something interesting. If people like it, I'm going to look at other stuff I've seen and try and match that. And that's why you get Logan's Run looking like the 1970s, right? Because it's copying what it's seeing. It's not, uh, it's a destination, not a journey, right? And the problem with that is, if we do authentic-based design, we can end up with a aesthetic design if the story needs it. But if the story needs to be gross and dark and ugly, then you make it ugly. Appeal is not something that is, should be a destination. It's part of the storytelling process. So if it needs to be appealing, great. If it doesn't, then it should be appealing. Our, we are supposed to be doing something that's authentic, not something that is just cool. So this can lead to all the other things, but it never goes the other way around. Okay, so that's how to recognize it out in the world. The next step, and, and probably the most important step for all of you, is identifying your authentic goals. So what are you bringing to the table? Now you know that you have to research it, depending on function and all stuff, but what do you as an individual say? So we hear a million times, what do I have to have my portfolio? And the answer is something great. Well, what is something great? Something I haven't seen before, something that's you. So you have to put you into this stuff, otherwise it's not interesting. So for me, my job as a production designer is I show up to the first meeting with the directors and they say, we have this idea for film that goes like this and like this and like this. And we want to make it like no, nothing that anyone's ever seen before. And I'm like, I don't have to do that. What do you mean? It's never been seen before. And so that's terrifying, for just it's, it's as tight, terrifying for me as it is for you. So naturally, my first response is I want to hire a team around me that all knows how to do something they've never seen before, take risks, take leaps, to have a point of view, a vision. I don't want everyone to think like me. That would be the worst case scenario, right? To have a bunch of robots that are copying you, then that's AI. Why would I want that on my phone? Right? I want ideas come that I can't expect because you have a different background than I do and have different experiences. So this is how we have to start to focus our portfolios around us. All right, how do you do that? This is a big one of my favorite quotes. I don't know if you know what Herman Melville is. He wrote uh, what he did, and he died kind of a failure. I mean, he was like, you know, he sold some books and stuff, but no one was like, hey. And it wasn't until after he died that people were like, oh wait, actually, he was way ahead of the time. He did amazing work. And now Moby Dick is seen as this amazing uh, 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 American literature. But in his lifetime, it wasn't. And yet, this is his book. Instead of fail or originality, he just succeeds in innovation. And his books are crazy that way. And that's what we need to start to do for ourselves. And this is hard. It means you're going to be vulnerable. All right? So to be authentic, how do we learn to be authentic? You are authentic already. It's just that you've learned to shield the world from it and hide the, your authenticity from the world. So uh, we learn to be authentic by taking risks and failing. Have to be willing to take a risk. We learn to be authentic by trying to understand what it means to be ourselves as a designer. You're not trying to be me, you're trying to be you. What does it mean to be you as a designer? I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. You are each are going to have to figure out what that is. Each of you failing and learning from your own mistakes is a hundred times more effective in you growing as a designer than me telling you how to do it. Right? Because you tried something and you're like, oh, that was not good. So I tried something in front of me and understand and I failed, and now that's seared into me as a human being, right? <laughs> so if he, Andrew Stanton sat me down before and said, hey, you know what? It'd be great if you just made storytelling a, 
priority that I'm worth, I wouldn't probably have remembered it, right? But it's deeply ingrained in who I am now. And so that's what we're going to have to do. So how do we do this? Here's a little, this is Charlie Kaufman. He wrote uh, Being John Malkovich and all these crazy out there films. And uh, Pampa asked him to give a talk about screenwriting. And he went off on this amazing rant about what it is to be. I don't know if you've seen this. It's fabulous. But here's a little quote from him about Pampa. Do not simplify. Let's not worry about what it looks like. Let's not worry about failure. Failure is a badge of honor. It means you risk failure. And if you don't risk failure, you're never going to do anything that's different than what you've already done or what somebody else has done. And just know that, that that's the choice you're making when you, when you won't put yourself at jeopardy like that. All right, failure. It's absolutely important. And I know it's scary. It, I, I have the same fears that you do. I'm a human being. So right now, and we don't need to get too deep in AI in this talk, but right, right now AI is coming out and it's terrifying all of us on some level. Right? And for me, there's a gift in it. Because it starts to point away from the things that are less important, the things that we do, that AI can never do. And those things are the things I've been talking about. In my mind, it, making we're not image generators. That's the result of what we do. But what we're actually doing is we are bouncing ideas off ourselves. So AI uh, to do what we do uh, requires intention, specificity, emotion, storytelling, and focus. AI requires none of those. It's unintentional, random, emotionless, not derived from storytelling and unfocused. So now we know what it is that we need to focus on. So maybe it isn't that we need to be the best renderer. Maybe it isn't that we have a ton of detail in our work. Maybe we start to focus on ourselves and storytelling and what we bring to the table as special, as an individual. Right? AI could not have had your life grown up the way that you grew up. It can't. And so what it's doing is averaging all the artwork that's being created in the world and making convincing uh, amalgamations of those. But it's not creating something from a human being. And the reason you cry at a Pixar movie is not because we are great as amalgamations because we put ourselves into it. We know what makes us cry, and we're authentic and believable and take risks to show that. And then you respond to that because you're a human being. That's our job as designers, okay? So don't be too scared of AI at this point. Okay, so how do we remain authentic in this situation? The process by which we become authentic designers and AI improve our careers is the same. Learn to be you in everything. You, and I really mean you. I don't know all of you, but you're all awesome and individual. We, as children, we're all good at this stuff, right? Children take a chance. They don't worry about what people think of them. They're vulnerable. They say silly things all the time because they don't have been taught that's the wrong way to do it. But all of us, as we grew up, were taught, no, you don't say that. You don't talk like that. You don't think about that stuff. That's taboo. That's not good. You, no, that's not going to draw something. The kids don't. But we need to find that place in us that can. The reason we're all here, right? Because we're artists and we're inspired by something. We need to get back to that place. All right. Here's another, a little bit more lengthy, but I absolutely love this song. People all over the world spend countless hours of their lives every week being fed entertainment in the forms of movies, TV shows, newspapers, YouTube videos, the internet. Um, and it's ludicrous to believe that this stuff doesn't alter our brains. And it's also equally ludicrous to believe that, at the very least, this mass distraction and manipulation is not convenient for the people who are in charge. People are starving. They may not know it because they're being fed mass-produced garbage. The packaging is colorful and it's loud, but it's being produced in the same factories that make Pop-Tarts and iPads. By people sitting around thinking, what can, we do, what can we do to get people to buy more of these? And they're very good at their jobs. But that's what it is you're getting because that's what they're making. They're selling you something. And the world is built on this now. Politics and government are built on this. Corporations are built on this. Interpersonal relationships are built on this. And we're starving, all of us. And we're killing each other. And we're hating each other. And we're calling each other liars and evil because it's all become marketing and we want to win. Because we're lonely and empty and scared and we're led to believe winning will change all that. But there is no winning. What can be done? Say who you are. Really say it in your life 
and in your work. Tell someone out there who's lost, someone not yet born, someone who won't be born for 500 years. Your writing will be a record of your time. It can't help but be. But more importantly, if you're honest about who you are, you'll help that person be less lonely in their world. Because that person will recognize him or herself in you. And that will give them hope. And it's done so for me. And I have to keep rediscovering it. It's profound importance in my life. Give that to the world, rather than selling something to the world. Don't allow yourself to be tricked into thinking that the way things are is the way the world must work, and that in the end, selling is what everyone must do. Try not to. This is uh, uh, um, from E.E. E. Cummings. To be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best, night and day, to make you everybody else means to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and never stop fighting. The world needs you. It doesn't need you at a party having read a book about how to appear smart at parties. These books exist, and they're tempting. But resist falling into that trap. The world needs you at the party, starting real conversations, saying, I don't know. That's a little bit long and, and a little bit loaded, but I, I love it. I love it because everyone has been, you know, when I went to school, everyone was telling me, no, you can't draw like this. That these are the people who got jobs before you draw like that. So that doesn't make you very marketable very long, right? I have a great friend who's here at the conference, John Burton. He said, we need a first rate you, not a second rate me. Right? They already have me at Pixar. They don't need another me. We need you. We need something that you have unique that I don't have. And we have to cultivate that in ourselves. It's hard and it's scary because it means we have to be vulnerable. We have to say that we don't have the answer and that we don't know and that it's scary for us too. But it is. So I'm just as scared as you are going into this. So for a first rate you take, uh, what does a first rate you take? The goal of this lecture is to give you the tools not only to push your technical ability, but to grow your creativity, your insight and your storytelling. One of the first steps is to uh, recognize that your creativity is a muscle. Recognizing it as such will allow you to begin to work with it. Sorry, I can not see my own slides here. Every day, so that when you need it, it'll work for you. This is where we start to get a little crazy. I'm just going to warn you. We start to get esoteric from here, as if it hasn't been esoteric enough. This is super important, but it may go over your head right now. It might have, certainly would have gone over my head when I was in school. It still goes over my head sometimes, but I think I want to talk about it anyway. So we're going to dive in. I, had, I teach a class at Art Center, and I asked them if I should put this in. I said, maybe. <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyway because I think it's important. This gentleman's name is Michael Wolf. He's a designer uh, in England. He um, ran giant advertising companies uh, and has been designing things all his life. He's an elderly man right there. This is from a podcast called Just a Chat With, which is a marvelous podcast, just talking to designers. I think all designers are the same. I don't think it doesn't matter what field you work in. I have good friends who work at Nike as few designers and talk about the same stuff all the time. It's really fun. And this is a great example of that. So I'm going to play it and we'll talk about it for what it means afterwards. So you, you mentioned there briefly the, the four rooms of creativity. Yeah. Uh, do you mind just Tell us that for it's, the kind of viewers and our listeners. It's very simple. Yeah. Um, and I found when I've told this little fable mm -hmm. that a lot of people in various professions recognize themselves in it. Mm -hmm. And basically, I use a metaphor of four rooms. Yeah. Little house, two rooms upstairs, two rooms downstairs. Mm -hmm. And I would spend a lot of time in the top room on the left, mm -hmm. which I call the room of great work which was being inspired by terrific designers. And in a sense, if I could produce work that looked as if they might have done it, I would settle for that. I would think that's, that's really good. I wasn't really interested in the clients. Yeah. I was interested in the work. And if it, if it looked as if maybe Alan Fletcher might have done it, I would just thinking oh, that was terrific. And I went on like that for, for quite a while. 
And then I met Ronnie Owens, mm -hmm. who um, was a serious grown-up. And that was very appealing to me because I probably wasn't a published, I'm not yet even actually. So he was logical, he was thorough, he'd run companies, and he was reasonable. Mm -hmm. So um, I abandoned the room of great work mm -hmm. and found myself being trained by Wally to explain the reason why. Mm -hmm. And it worked incredibly well because people preferred to deal with reasonable people yeah. than unreasonable. I mean, some people like unreasonable people, but on the whole reason is quite a good way of selling yeah. a solution. And it took me quite a while to realize that the, the root of reasonableness um, becomes dull, becomes mediocre, yeah. because nearly everybody is asking the same questions and getting the same answers. And that's why you get so much work looking similar. That's why all banks look the same, all airlines look the same. Yeah. You know, you have to put something on the tail, press the pilot up like a South American dictator, and uh, put the name on the side. You know, you know what, yeah. what, what you would do for an airline without thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So that described the second room for me. I didn't realize that these rooms existed. Yeah. And then the third room, I would call that the room of precedent. And it's full of designers who already know that what they do works, and so they go on doing it. And I found myself quite interested in that, because I would tend to gravitate to repetition. Mm -hmm. This worked, so I'll do it again. Yeah. And there was a sort of structure of habits that I didn't even question. Mm -hmm. But it's just, oh, this is, we do this, it's quicker and it's fine, and it works, and everyone's happy, and all the rest of it. So I sort of knew that these three, three rooms were interesting. Mm -hmm. It was stupid not to go into the room of, free, of, of great work, not to look at great work that people are doing. Yeah. But on the other hand, to see an office of people looking at the DVD handle for ideas isn't yes. really a very creative thing to do. Mm -hmm. And reason seemed to be a way of blinding one to something that was beyond reasonable, that was went beyond reason. It wasn't reasonable to call a computer company Apple. Yeah. Um, and then I saw repetition as a bit of a trap. You know, you, you, you'd stumble into it, and there you were recommending something pretty similar to what you'd done before. Yeah. And then, for some reason, I realised that there is a fourth room. And that is a room that I call not knowing. And that is when you've been into the first three rooms and you meet a client and you understand that they want a more expressive way of, of being, mm -hmm. you trust something in you, which is your creativity. And it will always perform for you, especially if you discard what you're learning in the first three rooms yeah. and just trust something innate in you, which you've all got. Um, and out pop solutions that have nothing to do with great work, nothing to do with reason, yeah. nothing to do with precedent. They're just a raw creativity. So I sort of wrote this as a little fable. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we'll stop there. So here's the three rooms, or four rooms. So this may be too crazy and esoteric, and that is totally fine. But at some point in your career, you will feel that you're one of these rooms. Many of you may be in the first room right now, and you just want to get your craft better. Again, it's super important to be in these rooms. It's super important to get better at your craft. I, I would not advocate that you don't be, don't become a good craft person. That uh, would be awful. Like, absolutely have to get good at craft. The room of good work is also where you develop taste, right? So we go in and say, oh, we like this, we don't like that. Why do I like this thing? Why do we don't like this thing? And at some point, you're gonna develop reasons why you do everything. So similar to what I was talking before, like I have reasons for doing form, uh, function over form. And those are very important, right? But then they become a precedent. So I just do it again and again and again. And that's where the problem with the precedence is vulnerability. So I actually would call the fourth room the room of vulnerability. So going into the room and trusting that your ideas are good, trusting that your opinion is worth it, trusting that your, um, 
kind of come up with solutions that are useful, that you're good enough. And so we all have imposter syndrome, especially when you started a new job. You think, oh, we know all these people are so great, they know what they're doing, they don't know what we're doing, they're going to figure us out. Everyone has that, I have that. And we need to get over that and be vulnerable in those situations, otherwise we're not going to show them any good stuff that we do have. And we're just going to be following in one of these sort of All right. A little bit away from the esoteric now, we'll bring it back to some practicality. So what are some processes and practices to do this? How do we develop this as a tool? So I said earlier that your creativity is a muscle. How do we train it? How do we start to work with it so that you're comfortable saying, oh, I have an idea, and throwing it out in the room, even though you do everything in your being is saying, shut up, shut up, shut up, just keep your head down. We all have that. And we need to be able to say, no, I believe in this idea, it's good, and start to hone those ideas so that you are able to catch them and recognize them as good ideas. So, oh, this is from my professor. It says, do the hard thing first. And the idea with this is, do that thing you're scared of. Or come that thing you're scared of. If you're scared of throwing hands, throw a bunch of hands. If you're scared of talking out, I'm an introvert. It may not look like it right now, but I'm an introvert. I had to train myself to talk in front of people. But I did it. I worked my way through school in an advertising agency. And they would just stick you in a room and be like, here's the client, go. And I was like, um, hi. <laughs> and they didn't like it. And, and they were like, can we get a different art director? And I was like, I need to learn to be able to communicate and say my ideas and be clear and succinct have ideas and be able to speak in complete sentences, and it's terrifying. Um, I still, after this, I'm going to go to my hotel and climb to a fetus position. But <laughs> in the moments, you just have to be able to, to do that. You have to be able to step outside of that and be honest, and, and yet, at the same time, be deeply connected to yourself and trust yourself. So I know these things are sometimes oxymorons, but uh, they are the same thing. I know these are seem impossible to be both confident and I'm confident and vulnerable and confident, but I promise you, if we work on these things, we'll be able to do it. So these are my tools for creative training. The first is research. Research, I know we've heard a ton of time in school that I need to get reference. That's not research. Reference getting is something you do for somebody else. Research is something you do for yourself. The research is about the joy of learning about your project, learning about yourself about ideas. I love research. Every single project that I'm on, I'm super excited because I get to go and learn about a new subject that I know nothing about. And that gives me so much joy. So we'll talk more about research. But research is invaluable in all of this. The second is observation. We'll talk about what that means in the last iteration. We'll go through this. So the research tool. Research is about listening to connections your mind is making and learning to listen to the I'm moved by this voice. This is where you're training yourself to recognize the things that you like, even if it's things that all your friends don't like. You need to listen to that voice, because that's who you are. Right? So even if you're in a room of people who are like, ah, man, I don't like it, you need to have an opinion that's your own. So because when I become production designer, when all of you become production designers, your director will say, I want to do something no one's ever did, done before, what do you think that would look like? And you need to have an opinion. You can't say, I'm going to call my professor. Hey, what would look good? You can't do that. You can't call up someone else. You have to build that within yourself. All right? So the I'm moved by this voice is you telling yourself that you like it. So we've all experienced this going through a museum, going through Instagram. You're looking at 100 pictures, and you're like, oh, my gosh. Going through the artist alley over here, right? You're going along, and that's cool. It's cool. Oh, my gosh. This is my favorite thing ever. Why? Why is that your favorite thing ever? Why isn't it everyone's favorite thing ever? Why, is, why are all those booths there and they all are so different? Because we all have different growths and personality and we need to train that. We need to listen to that voice. So research is about the willingness to do the hard work of trying to understand why you like something as much as being moved by it. So you're like, oh, I like that. Well, why do you like that? Instead of just liking things you like, question yourself. Build a, build a language around that. Build a ideas around that. And then you will be confident in those ideas. Right? Because you can defend them. Oh, I like this because I think it tells a story. And the things that I'm doing up here is defending myself. Right? I think Star Wars works for these reasons. You may think differently. But if you don't think about the reasons why, then it just passes you by. Right? Why don't I like this film as much as the last film? Ask that question. And actually uh, search that answer out. All right? That's the research tool. 
Um, modern psychology imagines the mind split between the rational and the emotional. This is not a real thing in our minds, but it's a way to start thinking about how we generate ideas. So for me, that I'm moved by this voice is your emotional voice. It's not rational, it doesn't make sense why you like something. But we have to start to then teach our rational voice to start to engage with that, right? And ask questions about it. So the rational voice is the voice that says that you're stuck. Oh, this that drawing not good enough, or why are you doing this, or uh, don't say anything out loud. And we need that voice. So what I've done is I try and put that voice to work. So if I'm moved by something, instead of just like saying, no, that's not good enough, people don't like it, or whatever, I ask why. And that puts your, your conscious mind to work on the task. Or if it says, I hate this drawing, or you're not good enough, or everyone's going to laugh at you, I ask, well, okay, what did I do wrong? Why? How can I do that? Try and put your mind to work. So this isn't necessarily a trick for everybody. You may find different tricks. But we actually start to have to work with our own psychology around this, to start to break these habits of hating what we do and liking what other people do and comparing ourselves to other people. That's not helpful. We have to build resilience within ourselves if we're going to be great designers, OK? So that leads us to the observation tool. The observation is about going to the source, not looking at how someone else already solved it. So what is, what is the instinct when we get our first assignment at school or our first project at work? Let's go, let's go see what other people are doing on Pinterest or let's see what someone else has done on Instagram. Right? That's a, a, a jumping back to the last one. That's it. Our cell, our rational mind saying you couldn't possibly have a good idea. So let's go see what someone else that you admire is doing. And we want to get away from that. We want to start going to the source. So when you have an assignment, go to the world. Go to reality and start to make your own dis distillations of reality. If you're struggling drawing hands, go look at 100 people's hands and draw those real hands and distill them in the way that you distill them because that's more interesting than how Milk Hall does it or how uh, you know, James Burney does it. That's great for them, but you're not trying to become them. You want to start to become yourself. And it's hard to do this because it's, you want a shortcut. It's painful. Right? It's painful to be like, I don't know how to draw this. And I look at that, and it's just gobbledygook. good. I don't know how to draw trees. I just draw a shape. But the trees are all built in a certain way, and you can start to dis discern those things. So that's what observing is doing. Go into the world and build your own language. Second part of that uh, observation is, should be about observing yourself as much as the work world around you. So when you're scared of something, do the hard thing first. Like you said, go back, dig into that. Observe yourself. Don't let yourself just do mindless design or run away and look on Instagram for your answer. Okay. One well, of the hardest parts of creating uh, is spending the time to materialize your ideas. Materialize is just another word for visualization. There's such a sense that it has to be instantaneous. That I have to have a great idea now. Or that I'll just draw and hope something good comes out. But what we're trying to do is get away from the automatic way our brain already works. We're trying to back up and say, slow down. What are you trying to draw? What in this next drawing, what is the solution? Right? So what am I going to try and do in the I if you do a drawing, you hate it, character design. Why don't I like this character design? The immediate reaction is what? I'll just draw another one. But you want it, or even worse, in Photoshop, command Z. Right? Draw uh, command Z. Uh, command Z. You're not learning from your mistakes. So draw a bunch of drawings. Draw it all the way through, and then say, why don't I like this? What is wrong with it? And then the next one, what am I going to do differently? Instead of just drawing randomly again. So everything is done with intention. And we're building that and training that muscle to be creative when you need to. And then the more you train that, you'll be in a situation, and you'll be able to draw a drawing, and it'll come up great the first time. Because you've trained yourself to observe what you're trying to do, and doing everything focused. All right. So that is the iteration tool. The iteration tool in this context is a hard work of processing those observations through drawing and design. But most people stop. So right, I've done a research, I've done some observing of what I want to do. I like this head, I like that body, and then making the character design, I do a drawing, and then I'm stuck there because it's not what I want it to be. So you can either cycle in one of these, you can cycle in the observation phase, you can cycle the drawing phase, but try again and again and again. If you're struggling, go all the way back to the beginning and do research again. It's not going to say you can't do research in the middle of a project. You don't have to do it just at the beginning. All right. A 
as designers, the sooner we realize that we will never get it right on the first try, the better off we will be. This is an iterative process. There is no one size fits all. We just have to go again and again and again. And, but we want to go with intention. All right. So I'm going to take you through all the things. And then just as a recap here, beginning to recognize authenticity and visual development. We're going to design with purpose, act as functional form. Um, identifying our authentic voice. We're going to recognize we're in one of these rooms. The room could work, the room of reason, the rest of the room of custom, which is great. And try and go to the next one. See if you can have a reason for the choices you're making if you're in the room of good work. After that, uh, we're going to try and figure out a process for turning our creativity. And that process is due using research, observation, and iteration. Again and again. If you forget all of this, oh, just a caveat, your process will be different than mine. So this is the way that I have made this in my brain, but my brain works different than all of your brain. So take these things and try them out. If it doesn't work for you, try something else out. But everything is done with attention and design. If you forget all that, we are trying to turn this into this. Or even less, you're not just an artist, Sam, but you're still done. That is it. I'm happy to answer any questions you have.
And so it means that you grab something underwater and you're like, ooh, look how cool that's going to be. You pull it. Like, yeah. You know, that looks cool. Everyone, it's that kind of like mystery of it is exciting. And as soon as we make it something real, we're like, ah, that's not impressive. It's this kind of mysterious thing we have in our mind. So yeah, that would be amazing. Yes? Um, like I said, when you get to that point when you're like, So for me, I, it's similar stuff that I was talking about today, but I have little mental tricks that I do to get myself to keep working on it. And so sometimes it's just about, I'm just going to make this one drawing that I'm doing really cool, really good. I'm just going to work on craftsmanship right now because I can be the choice that the director made. I don't think it's right for the movie, but I'm just going to do it, and I'm going to focus on how, how nice my drawing is. Um, for me, a part of a process of getting into any project, especially if I'm not on my project, is trying to figure out a way to access it. Because you have to be emotionally invested, otherwise you won't do great work. So an example of that for me is Cars 3. I, I love that they're movies, but I don't like cars as a person. Like, I, okay? And I think you know some old cars have cool designs, but I'm not that interested in it. And the whole world of it wasn't interesting to me. So the way I got myself excited about it was uh, old cars. Like some old car designs, I was like, oh, cool. And, and I started learning some of the old designers and why they made choices. And that got me interested in it. And then I got interested in the, the whole movie takes place in the South, in Georgia and South Carolina. And it was a new environment for me that I'd never been in. And it's awesome and it's different. And there's like really like these pine stands that are in sand that are beautiful and something unique that I'd never seen anywhere else in the world. So I got excited about those elements. That allows me to get excited about the movie and the design, even though I don't care about Queen. Yeah, sorry, it just be important. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Okay, so my question is, um, I got a lot of advice before that's like, it's good to steal from other artists, so in your opinion, when does it become bad to get inspiration from other hmm. artists? Great question. So for me, that's the first room. I make the room of great works. It's great to learn from other artists. So they say great artists borrow, great, or good artists borrow, great artists steal. For me, that's not stealing what they do. For me, that's learning from them. So if I, Mike Mignola is an artist that I'm super into in high school, I still think he's amazing, I saw him the other night. Uh, and I didn't want to draw like Mignola in the end, but there were so many choices he was making that I didn't understand what those were, compositionally, and lighting-wise, and form-wise. And so my job was to go in and harvest all that and put it into me and say, do I like this, do I not? And I rejected a bunch of the choices that he made because it wasn't me. But I want to understand those choices. So when I'm borrowing from another artist or stealing from another artist, it's a process of growing myself, not trying to you know, copy their style or beat them. Because they'll always be better than I will. Right? I'll just be a pay-off pay comparison because I haven't gone through their experience. If I do that on my own, that's better. So that's the way the distinction I make between it is if it's for growth, absolutely look at other artists. If it's for solutions, do not. Great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I've just been, you know, walking around my block and stuff, saying people like do old boards and like the group game desks and stuff like that. And yeah. I just kind of noticed, like, you know, I, I don't really know how to, like, draw too many things. Mm -hmm. you know, like, people are, like, drawing all sorts of, like, different, like, creatures. Yeah. And so it was like, oh, well, I really can't, I really don't doodle that much, like, doodle like the other way people do. Yeah. I was thinking, like, do you have any advice for, like, learning to, like, draw more things? Like, if someone said, hey, can you draw, like, I don't know, like, a scenario? I know some people can just, like, kind of, like, are able to, like, kind of, like, just, just kind of, like, draw it, like, yeah. pretty, like pretty well, like, kind of descriptively, or just, like, get the, the story from. Yeah. So I was thinking, like, yeah, what was the best way to, like, Yeah, it's a great question. Um, for me, it's, it's some of it's just time, right? So some of it's gonna be time. And when you go walk and see a board of all these people drawing all those things, the thing that you see them drawing might be their thing, just like you have a thing, right? And so it may seem like, oh, I don't know all these people know how to do it. They're just doing their little title. I was saying when I was in school, like I used the things that I was good at and I liked them and I, I hated characters because I couldn't draw them well, right? Um, and that's okay. Um, I think. For 
me, it's more important that you develop uh, who you are as an artist and things you're interested in than just your craft. Because that will drive you to do those other things. Right? So if you're interested in more things, you'll want to draw them. So if you're not interested in horses, you're never going to get good at drawing horses. <laughs> or unless you're on a project for horses, because you don't want to do that. Um, and so for me, it's about getting interested in other things, similar to the question that you just asked. How do I get excited about cars in the world? And so I got figured out a way to get excited about it, and then I drew more of that stuff. Because I had never drawn cars before that, and I sucked at it. And I was like, how do I get excited about drawing cars? I hate drawing cars. And I was looking at these old designs that were like super cool, and drawing those got me excited about drawing cars, and then I had to learn how to draw cars. And so for me, that's the job. Our job is to keep trying to leave our mind first. Rarely does our ability craft-wise exceed our emotional state and mind. Our mind always goes out and then our craft catches up. Right? It's the same with music, it's the same with everything. You want to learn how to play a new instrument, you, your desire is there long before your ability to play the instrument is there. And so keep pushing yourself out there. You see something like that, you're like, I want to learn how to draw that thing. Do that. Do that hard thing first. But your mind will get there and, you, and it'll be painful until your body, until your, your skills catch up. Yeah, great question. Yes? Yeah. Like, well, how does one get there, and mm -hmm. who is that job right for as well? Those are big questions. Um, <laughs> let's do the second one first. Yeah. The job is for anyone who wants to do it, honestly. So I don't. I didn't want to be a production designer or creative director. I was quite happy being an individual contributor. Um, and the reason that I did it was because I felt there was a better way to run our I didn't like people yelling at people, or throwing things at them, or demeaning them. And, and uh, while that only happened a couple times to me, I was like, but I had a, literally I had a worry that to be that person, you had to be that way. That was the only way that it could happen, right? Yeah. That that the only way you'd become a jerk if you got that job. So like, I don't want that job. I don't want to be a jerk. And then there was part of me that was like, wait, that's that's ridiculous. There has to be a way to do it. And so that's the only reason I became was so just to show that you could production design movies without being a jerk, honestly. And so is it right for me? I, I don't know. I'm doing it. And so so I don't think it had you know, there's not a, a right answer for that. It's if you have the desire and want to be in the right place of that. Um, again, I'm an introvert who just I wanted to be like Alan Lee, I don't know if you know him, did the Lord of the Rings design stuff. For many years he lived out in the English countryside of cottage and just drew fantasy stuff all day. And I was like, that is what I want to do. <laughs> and here I am talking in front of people at an animation conference. So you just have to follow the path, and if you're comfortable, go with it. And if you're not comfortable, don't go with it. I would say a similar thing for how to get there. I, that, what I tell everyone is you want two careers. The idea that we're going to be a student and then get our dream job and just go all the way through is unrealistic. If it was unrealistic for me, it's unrealistic for everybody. And there may be a small handful of people it's like getting famous on Instagram. But that shouldn't be the goal. So your small career is, I want to get in the industry I want to be in. So I was in advertising, and I made way more money in advertising than I did starting at ILM. I worked three days a week in advertising, and I made the same amount of money that I made working full time at ILM. But I wanted to be in that field, and I was willing to take the risk to do that, and be young, and say that's the time to take those risks. Um, and so, that was my foot in the door job. And your foot in the door job is, I'm in the, in, with the people I want to be doing, seeing the things I want to be doing. And so I don't care what that is. I don't care if it's a PA, I don't care if it's a whatever. You want to be around those people creating that stuff. And then you worry about the long-term career. Do I like it? Do I like these people? Do I fit in with them? Are they my people? Maybe they're not. Maybe you're a, an architect, and you are with the wrong people. That's totally fine. But find those people and figure out, Going down, can you not hear me? Or am I speaking? Do I need this? <laughs> okay, so, so try to figure that out, I think, is the thing. Um, and I would say just get a job. And even, I mean, even if you have to be another, you need a Starbucks to do this thing. Great! Uh, no, don't laugh, that's absolutely great. 
Oh, do you? Oh, okay. <laughs> I would say absolutely do that because that gives you this time to be like, I don't have to worry about becoming the best barista in the world. I want to focus on this other thing, but I can just go and do it and make a living and make money and pay my bills and then do the next step, right? Getting my foot in the door to company, I may have the job that I want to do and work the way up. But it has to be a step. The idea that we just leap into this thing is, is unrealistic. It changes, is all I, I can say, is mine changes. I had a timeline too, and it didn't work at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but it doesn't matter, right? Like, I'm still, I, I, right now I'm not to change anything. And now I'm trying to do, the, I'm on the other end, honestly. I'm trying to get the next generation up so I can go be a farmer or something. <laughs> honestly, I, I, I love plants and I want to run a nursery and be a little dude in a shack somewhere. Like, I don't, I mean, was never doing any of this for fame. I mean, the money is okay so that I can become a farmer. Uh, but th that's not what it is about for me. And so I think the timeline, I would say, helped me navigate and make choices and priorities and say, like, okay, I'm not getting where I want to get to, so I have to make some choices in my life. And if it means I don't get to play video games anymore because I need to draw more, that's a choice I'm going to make. So that is a, a way for it to be helpful, but it's not helpful in the fact that, oh, I missed my deadline. I want to be this by I was 30. That's very destructive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, quick question, but I realize it might be a longer answer. I would okay. love to learn, like, via examples of, like, this image, how you kind of put the sort of, like, thought process into making this image in particular. Yes. This was a super striking thing when I thought you were doing. It's always been something I come back to when looking at your work. So. Oh, thanks. Uh, so the thinking is uh, research, 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 research. So I'm, my heritage is Polish, and I was trying to do a Polish, uh, you as well, yeah, they can kick that in a minute. But uh, I was doing a Polish folk more, I'm sorry, my own story. And uh, I, I just got immersed in culture. I didn't know my heritage. I mean, my, my grandparents, and they told me about my culture, I my family. And they're all hiding. <laughs> It's my wife, Gloria, and Ali, and Madeline. Um, but I didn't, uh, I didn't know that much about my culture, and so it was this fun thing that I just got totally all the bells and the stuff come from festivals from the New Year and stuff. And so all this stuff is just built out of that language, and I got super uh, interested in the landscape of Poland and what it used to look like, and it, the, the land moved, and then. Uh, different cultures that went through Poland, and it just allowed me to just get immersed in it. And then when you're creating, you have this deep well of stuff. And it, it kind of similar to your question as well, like how do I do other stuff? If you if you research it and get excited about it, it drives your creativity. Because then there's like this well of all these ideas that you can pull out. Oh, that would fit with that thing that I had from soft in that festival, would fit right in here. But if you're just drawing all from your head and you're not doing any research, you're just drawing the same thing over again because your brain can't get bigger. Like it doesn't, new ideas come from eating it. They don't come from thin air. And so that process is basically all my work is that. It's just getting deeply immersed in design and fun, and the fun of, of researching. Um, and it doesn't have to be like getting reference. It's really loving whatever it is you're getting into. Yeah. Thank you. That's my best answer. Yeah, please. Sorry, That is you. That's not somebody else. 
that's you knowing it. And it is if you dig into it and you realize I don't really like this anymore because of these things, then you're fine and you move on to the next thing. But that knowing in yourself, uh, you'll start to do drawings that you feel like I'm not seeing anyone else do this and it feels risky and it feels like no one's gonna like this. But I really like it, that's you. That's not somebody else. And that's the thing that we're chasing for. That's that voice that's telling you, that's cool. And it may tell you things that someone else tells you that directly contradict that. I'm sure my kids can attest to this. They're like, I don't like drawing, I don't care what you know. And they're like, but I like it. And I want that. And you want that ability to say, no, this is me, and this is what I, why I got into this, and this is what inspired me. Yeah. Awesome. Are they kicking us out? So you're supposed to be done, I think, at 3, but Okay, it's we're like at 3.09, so okay, let's wrap it up. <laughs>